Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm David Gersten. I'm the director of uh, Arts Letters and Numbers. And I want to welcome you all to this really wonderful conversation we're going to have with Ren Weschler and Riva Lera. Um, this program is part of our, our ongoing series uh, of conversations titled Mr. Weschler's Cabinet of Wonders that Ren has curated for our Sunship exhibition in the 17th uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. And I really want to thank you, Ren, for, for all that you're bringing to this uh, project. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I want to welcome and thank Riva Lair for joining us today. Riva, it is really an honor to have you here. Um, and I'll say Riva Lara is a, is a leading figure in, in disability culture in the United States. And she's known internationally as a portrait artist whose uh, work challenges staid conceptions of beauty through images that depict the power and allure of variant bodies and lives. And her, her incredible book, uh, Golem Girl, won the Barbellion Prize and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography. And we are uh, going to put a, a, a link in the, uh, in the chat to that book uh, right now. Uh, so I'll just add that at the end of this conversation, we will have time for some questions uh, from the audience. And so if you do have questions, please write them in the chat and I will come back in at the end and share them with uh, Ren and Riva. Um, and so now I'm going to pass it on to Ren uh, Weschler and Riva Lara to begin the program. So thank you for coming. Thank you, David. So let's see, am I, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, there I am. Okay, hey Riva, uh, so good to see you. And thank you all for coming. Um, many of you already know this, but, uh, or have found, realized in, over the last year, that in addition to being a, a, a remarkable activist and, a, and an extraordinary uh, artist, it turns out you're a damn good writer. Thank it's you. Just, it's just not fair. <laughs> and, and there's the book, Golem Girl. Um, and all I can do is just urge all of you watching this to get it because it, uh, apart from all the, all the uh, nu nutritional value, it's just incredibly funny and improbably funny and uh, gloriously written. So I'll do that a few times during the, the conversation. But meanwhile, Riva, let's come to you. Uh, we actually agreed that we'd kind of set up a, a, a few images for, for you to bounce off of at the beginning. And, and maybe we should just start that unless you have anything you want to say before we get started. No, it's absolutely an amazing uh, turn of life to be here. And um, uh, if only we were meeting in Venice, that would be the only way it would be even better. So <laughs> we'll do that next time. Next year. Okay, so let me uh, attempt the, um, the the dramatic screen share issue. And are we good, people? Good, yeah. You this got it. The way it's supposed to. All yeah, right. Sure. <clears throat> so, Mr. Weschler, shall we? Do you want to? Tour well, I, I'll just begin by saying this is this is a this is uh, an image. One thing I sometimes say, and and I know it makes you. I say it partly because I love watching your face when I say it. <laughs> is that uh, that you have no business being alive? Uh, <laughs> which by which, I mean, by which I mean that people born as you were two or three years before you were born, uh, in your case with spina bifida, <laughs> had a very very short uh, prognosis, and. Uh, and you are really right at the edge of the first generation of people who survived and have thrived. And uh, in your case, I know from having read the book and having known you for many years, it has everything to do with that woman on your tattoo and that image of, in, uh, in your self-portrait from back in 1997. Um, and maybe you can explain why. Well, um, so first off to just no pun intended, flesh out your first point. Uh, the spina bifida is more or less a hole in the spine. Um, it's a, 
a defect in the neural tube that becomes the spine <clears throat> and the spinal cord. And they didn't know for ever how to close it. So uh, the, the ethic of the time was to wait until the child survived being more than two years old. <clears throat> and if that happened, um, they would try and do some surgical intervention, but one might imagine that having a hole in your spine does not uh, bode well for surviving until you're two. So there weren't a lot of people that did. And, um, but when I was born, there had been a young surgeon who was hired at the hospital uh, across the street from where I was born, who was trained in a brand new technique. Um, the other factor in the story is that my mother had been, and I didn't know this until just a few years ago, um, had been not a medical secretary, as I had thought, but a medical researcher for a man named Yosef Warkany, who was uh, known as the father of teratology. I'll show his picture in, in just a moment. And so she was used to disabled children of all kinds. So the two things that happened were that um, Dr. Martin, my surgeon, was able to close the hole. And my mother, because she was used to disabled kids, took me home instead of let, letting them institutionalize me, which is what happened to so many people from my generation that even managed to be uh, surgically um, maintained. They still ended up in an institution. So this self-portrait was done uh, when I reached the exact age that my mother was when she died. So I was thinking about um, all of the ways that our lives are interconnected, but this was years and years before I even thought about writing a book about her. So that's a condensed story here in this portrait. Um, if I go to the next image, in theory, if I go to the next image, <laughs> There's my mother um, just after getting married. And what I love here is that she's showing off, carefully showing off the new wedding ring. So, um, so you get some idea of my mother as a young woman. And um, here is Children's Hospital. Um, <clears throat> it was a little bit more advanced than this when I was born. <laughs> this is not actually the automobile at the moment. You were born in Cincinnati. Yes. 1958. And uh, that in turn has a great deal to do with your surviving because it just so happened that in Cincinnati, this research was going on. Yes. Right. Right. And um, it was this uh, cluster of doctors who were doing really groundbreaking uh, research into pediatric conditions. And one of them actually was Albert Sabin. He was the head of pediatric research. So Dr. Work and he was working with Dr. Sabin. And at one point, um, towards the end of the race for the polio vaccine, Dr. Workney loaned my mother to Albert Sabin. So she used to tell us the story that the day that Jonas Salk announced that um, he had found the, the formula for a workable polio vaccine, that this came over the radio that was playing in the lab. And he, Sabin was so enraged that he, like, he, he picked up a beaker of something unknown and threw it the length of the lab while screaming at top volume and everyone's just diving out of the way. But the real irony is that the polio vaccine that went on to be much more used was Sabin's, even though Salk has the Nobel Prize and the, <clears throat> the fancy institute. That's a lesson in our, they're somewhere for us. But yeah, Cincinnati was quite the place at the time. So this is my mother working for a doctor right before she went to work for work and he, and i just love this picture I and mean, she looks like such a hot babe they're crouching in the back behind all the the white guy you know white guys in white coats this guy looks a little bit shady uh and then this is dr yosef work um who like i said was uh called the father of teratology and teratology is the study of birth defects smoldering don't you think and this is what spina bifida looks like, the kind that I had. So um, this is, I, forgive me if these are disturbing images, I should have warned people. But um, 
it's literally a hole in the spine and very often there's a, a balloon that encases the extruding spinal cord. So the baby's spinal cord is outside the body here. So in order to close the lesion, they had to figure out how to get the spinal cord back into the canal and close up all the layers and um, still leave the baby with some function. And skipping forward to slightly less gruesome, um, that is me in the hospital. So one of the things in the story is that I didn't come home until I was two. So a lot of, most of my early baby pictures are all in the hospital. So you can see mom here <clears throat> um, in a hospital, you know, protective gown. And another one because Ren didn't want me to take any of these out. I'm clearly saying, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> and, uh, and then my first birthday in the hospital where this was a gift from, um, from my uncle who brought me beads that I could chew on. So I'm still looking doubtful about the whole thing. And so I did before eventually- we go, be, Before we go here, so you were just saying you were in the hospital, you did not leave the hospital until you were two. And the only reason you left when one reads the, the book is that your mother uh, orchestrated this entire dog and pony show of how advanced you were and how you wanted to leave the hospital and so forth. Otherwise they would not have let you out, basically. It was a real campaign on her part to, to do what, what they didn't want to have happen. Well, one of the things, and I wanna to get to what we were talking about the other day about the influence of the hospital on who I am. Um, which is why we're showing this. The, I'm not showing these images to be cute or pathetic or anything like that. Even though um, you are incredibly cute. And occasionally pathetic. <laughs> but um, even today, uh, so kids like me were considered um, to have uh, that we would all grow up to be the, the classic vegetable and you know I always think broccoli for some reason um and it's one of the reasons we were institutionalized is that uh, the assumption was that we would not have normal intelligence we weren't worth you know trying to uh, incorporate into society and so my mom uh did this this magic trick where she taught me uh to memorize all the names of the drugs that they had me on and one day when my, the Grand Rounds came in, she basically, she was like one step away from a ventriloquist and had me critiquing all my medications, looking only slightly older than this. And um, it had an effect. They, uh, I don't know all the conversations, but they stopped pressing her to put me away. Um, but I've thought quite a bit about what it meant to grow up in the hospital. Um, I am, and we'll see in a little while, I'm a visual artist um, who's become very aware of the way that my brain was affected by um, growing up in a series of white rooms where I never left the building. I mean, I never left the building for over two years. And think about what a hospital is like. Um, there aren't animals. Uh, there's a picture in a while that seems to refute that. I don't ever remember this thing happening, but um, there really aren't plants. You don't see outside. You don't experience weather. You don't move around in space. You don't, you know, it's not a wide variety of different kinds of people coming through sort of limited cross section. So among other things, I can't draw perspective um, I think, for me, I think it's down to always being <clears throat> in these constricted spaces and constricted inside these constricted spaces. And then uh, other things like in those spaces, you're always, anyone can walk in at any moment of the day, of the night, and do something really terrible to you that you don't understand. So I'm a very, very anxious person, which when has to put up with on a regular basis. Sorry, dear. But I think part of it, besides genetics, is that um, when you, and I mean, even when I came home 
after two, I went back and went back. I mean, I think I've been in the hospital at least 300 times. 300 and, times. Yeah, about 300 times. I tried to add it up once. It's, it's at least got to be that. By the way, before you go <laughs> on, before you go on, it just occurred to me as you were talking, it hadn't occurred to me yesterday when we were talking about this, that you are like a, as an artist, you have shows in white cubes and you were raised in a white cube in an important way and are regularly back, you are back and forth between different white cubes in the world. Uh, and uh, Might be a reason why I like museums so much. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But anyway, so you were just saying that, <clears throat> that even after you got out, you were back in the hospital. Going, and yeah. that's giving you occasion to really think about, you have pictures further on ahead of you at the age of five and so forth, but it's given you occasion to, to really think about the architecture of, of, of hospitals, especially as seen from the point of view of children? Well, some of the things, do you want me to continue with images? And yeah, sure. And, there and are some do, do it the way you that. were going to do it. Do it There's the way some pictures doing. of the hospital that might kind of help. Um, so this is me soon after I came home. I'm probably four here, something like that. Um, I still have that doll. It's up in my closet. Hmm. Um, so here are uh, some pictures. I found this book, I ordered a number of years ago when I was writing Golem Girl. Um, this, um, I don't know if you can see it. There are these companies that will make uh, books on demand for museums and hospitals and corporations. And this is Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, you know, a history. So you can see on the cover, there's a kid in an iron lung. So these are just a few pictures, and some of these I, I do remember a lot of the doctors in here, but um, this is pretty close to when I was there. I mean, this is the lower one is 1961, and um, you can see there is apparently a fish pond. I again, I, there are things I don't remember, but I do remember being pushed around on a gurney like those, or being in these enormous wheelchairs where. You couldn't push any of the wheelchairs yourself at the time. You couldn't go. Look at that wheelchair the boy is in over there. Yeah, that the, is that there. is a that is a chariot of fire, man. And so, I mean, it wasn't like you could jump in a wheelchair and take off down the hall. You were totally dependent. So, um, here's a larger shot of one of the playrooms. Um, children who are on medical orders not to walk were transported to the playroom on carts so they could enjoy activities with other children. You can see how much they're enjoying playing together. <laughs> Looks a little like a cluster of, uh, of islands. Um, but the thing is that one of the things about how, um, I mean, they, they emphasize all this togetherness in the book, but that really was a minimum of the amount of time I spent there. Um, you had to get to a certain point where they weren't worried about you being hurt or hurting yourself, which I guess my mother was immensely overprotective. So I can see that her telling them not to let me do a lot of the stuff. But think about what it's like for a kid in the hospital. You are on pause. The architecture is repetitive. There will be an occasional room like this, but mainly all the rooms are dedicated to treatment or containment or conferences that you're not part of. And so when you're in, you're in stasis. Um, you're not learning how to grow up. You might get some school lessons. Mainly I didn't. They just sort of dropped off books and my mother and I studied together. Um, I think that there were classrooms, but I was never part of them, and maybe there weren't, I don't know. But the things that children experience that tell them how to, how to be children, how to be different levels of children, and then how to eventually be adults, you know, the complexity of space, of social discourse, of uh, the dangers of the world, the pleasures of the world, you're not learning any of it. What you're learning for the most part is to be passive and to let them do whatever they want to you and not to be bad, meaning throwing a tantrum, screaming, refusing to let them treat you, having, you know, so. 
Do passion, uh, passive and pa and patient share a root, I wonder? I don't know. Huh? Uh, so you, are that, being, you, are, you are being trained to be a patient, yeah. which is to say be passive. Yes. They, they be do. acted upon, oh, not sorry. to be an agent. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You are not an agent of your own trajectory in any way. So think about, you know, in the traditional hospital, what you have is this series of sterilized sterilizable rooms you can't um make a mark on them you don't have places to put things down very much i mean i don't know what kids hospitals are like now all i can speak to are the ones that i've been in as a child and as an adult and you can't decorate the room to remind you who you are you don't have shelves that will display who you are you it's very very limited and they don't want you to bring anything in that's going to interfere with cleaning or transport germs and so you learn also in the hospital that once you leave all trace of you is erased so you come back and there's no there's often very little institutional memory of you except maybe for your doctor but the nurses will all be different the interns and residents will all be different there's no trace of you on the walls. There's no trace of you in the building. So it's as if each time you go in, you're a non-person again, fighting to be remembered as a person. And it just goes on and over and over and over and over. So I think of hospitals as this, I won't read this part of the book, but I describe them as, you know, these brutal environments with a thin layer of whimsy laid on top, at least in terms of children's hospitals, this kind of delicate veneer that tries to distract and ameliorate the truth of the space. But kids aren't stupid, they know. So I know that hospitals to varying degrees try their best, but I think that there are ways that we can talk about at the end that, um, might be small steps that they could take and maybe they're taking now um, to help a kid feel a continuous sense of self because the other thing that happens in children's hospitals is that what gets decorated are all the get well cards you have all these get well cards on your tray table maybe they tape them to the wall maybe they're you know but what are they telling you you're sick you're sick, you're sick, you're sick. You're on pause, you're away from everything in your life. It's not really a reminder of you outside of the state of illness. So after- well, One of the things that's quite fascinating about the book, if you think about it, is, is it's partly about the construction of self that you managed to claw back after you know, when one talks about child psychology, those first four or five years are the time when theory of mind is coming into being, when, when you are, in fact, you know, supposed to be a huge part of the development as a human being is taking place. And you had to kind of catch up on that on the far side, again, with the help of your mother. But, but uh, anyway, continue on. Go ahead. Let's, let's, let's move on. I, no, I, I, I mean, one of the things that we'll talk about, hello, Cursor, where did you go? Um, is that uh, it's also what made me into a portrait artist. Mm -hmm. So after, and we're not gonna do a whole travelogue of my life, I'm gonna go fast here. Mm -hmm. But after the hospital, I went to another institution, um, not a residential institution, but another building, um, which was architecturally fascinating for you, you architects out there, um, this place, Condon School was uh, opened in 1921, I think, and was absolutely state of the art accessibility, uh, like almost in the world at the time. Um, there was one school in America that was slightly ahead of it, actually in Cleveland called the Sunshine School. But Condon was one of the first schools ever built completely for kids with mobility impairments although later on it ended up opening up to a wider range of impairments, but it had things like, um, let's see, do I have any pictures? This is a facade, it'll, 
So what's interesting here is that this isn't how you actually came in. This was kind of the uh, the impressive entry. And this is all, for anyone who knows what Rookwood pottery is, these were all done by the Rookwood pottery, which is one of the great arts and crafts uh, ceramics um, studios of the 20th century. This is me in second grade. Um, I'm there. Um, I don't know why I put that in. I was <laughs> my my first gallery show, um, but uh, Condon um, had things like you came in through the back, and the back was completely ramped. Um, that was it was a continuous entry, and then you went up these elevators. Uh, so the the school was sort of structured around central elevators. And then at each uh, in each classroom, there was a pair of bathrooms. Um, there were uh, this was the physical therapy wing, which was enormous. The medical wing was was substantial um, and included doctor's office, nurse's office, dentist's office, exam rooms. It had its real downsides. Um, it was very hard to make a division between uh, school in the hospital at times. Um, also, a lot of times my roommates in the hospital were classmates of mine and nurses would come into the classroom uh, during the day and give medicine in the middle of class. And then you would leave, you know, geography class and then go down this, the hall to physical therapy or occupational therapy or speech therapy or and like I said in the book, if it, it, the word therapy was in it, we had it, it was there. Um, no, sorry. No, 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 go back, go back. Uh, so the problem is with Condon is that, um, and I was both passionate about it and tortured about it. Actually, right now, I'm wearing this uh, medallion that I asked for as my eighth grade graduation from Condon. And it just says Condon School, not 63 to 72 because when I left in 72, um, we were not prepared for the outside world. We weren't told to think about careers or options or relationships or higher education. At the time, there was no, uh, there was no legal uh, reason why a high school was required to let us in. So for a lot of kids, eighth grade was, was the end. That's as much education as they got. And so society was just as welcoming. Come in, little cripple. There we have this lovely institution for you. Um, and so uh, Condon was a lot like the island of Dr. Moreau. You know, you were with your own kind, and it was a relief. But once you left, you were the monster who was kicked off the island. So um, anyway, so there is a section I'm going to read uh, from the book. And it takes place when I'm 12. And I found this picture of me on my 12th birthday. And as some compatriots will know, yarn hair was big that year. So <clears throat> let me pull up my uh, PDF. And forgive me, I've been having um, some voice problems lately, so I will do my best to not rasp my way through this. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. Reading glasses. All right, so this is 1970. Um, I've just had a, a sudden medical crisis um, overnight and ended up in the ER. They don't quite know what's wrong with me yet. Um, but I've been checked into my room, and this is uh, the second night that I'm in the hospital while they're trying to figure out what's wrong. And pardon me, I have to just, I'm going to mute for one second so that I can clear my throat. Okay. Now you settle down, toots. Try to keep your eyes closed. You'll fall asleep before you know it. The nurse's arm rose and fell as she switched off the overhead lights again. 
Susie, that's my roommate, emitted a demure waffling snore as if to prove that she at least was an accomplished sleeper. She would never press the call button for no good reason. I usually put myself to sleep by reading from the stack of Nancy Drew mysteries by my bed, but the reading light would wake up my placid roomie. So I tried to soothe myself with the rhythms of the hall, the squeak of rubber soles, the rattle of carts, the chatter of on-call residents. No luck, it was me against the night. Intravenous poles circled my bed like steel trees, branches heavy with saline and antibiotics. Reedy tendrils of plastic tubing looped down like airborne roots and planted themselves in my arms. I had to stay careful since the wrong move could dislodge a needle and trigger an hour's search for a usable vein. <clears throat> Blue light flickered in the patient rooms across Bernard Avenue. Jewish hospital was mostly for grown-ups. Their nurses couldn't make them go to sleep. I bet every TV was turned to the Tonight Show. Mom and Dad let me stay up and watch when I was sick, and since there was no chance I was going to school tomorrow, why not let me stay up and see if Johnny Carson had Stiller and Mira or Joan Rivers? Yes, that is how old I am. <clears throat> Children's Hospital was only a few blocks from the Cincinnati Zoo. When the wind was right, I could hear the elephants and lions singing to the ambulances and a call and response to the sirens' delirious howls. I knew how it felt to be caged. I could still remember my earliest hospital beds, metal cribs raised several feet off the floor with barks. Don't worry, keep going. That was interesting. Metal cribs raised several feet off the floor with bars that locked in place so I wouldn't fall out or go anywhere at all given that a hospital floor is as dangerous as the surface of Mars. The staff attempted to contain, oh gosh, I forgot to stop screen, screen sharing. It's okay, you're, you're fine. Um, no sleep, y'all. The staff attempted to contain our intrepid toddler spirit, but inevitably some tiny explorer would climb up and over the bars trailing IVs like parachute cords. I had long ago graduated to beds with low locking rails, beds that offered a small modicum of freedom, but these came with a bargain. As you grew up, you were expected to control yourself. No playing with IV lines to scoot the bubbles up and down the tube, no pulling off the oxygen mask, no matter how sweaty your face got, no scratching or peeking under the bandages, no examination of stitches, no pushing the nurse call button just because you were lonely. Above all, keep your hands off the equipment, even if it stuck a hundred appendages into your arms, up your nose or down your throat. I'd have wiggled out the bed, and roamed, the hall, roamed the halls if I hadn't been afraid to bring a steel tree down on my head and smash the antibiotics all over the floor. Dawn brought the phlebotomist a sponge bath six pills in white paper cups, and a ravenous wait for the breakfast cart, a single serving box of Rice Krispies, a red and white carton of milk, and a sour greenish banana. I remained marooned in the ring of poles all day till someone came to bleed me or feed me or roll me downstairs. Sorry about that. I've never done that with the text on screen. Things you learn. So anyway, that's how old I was. Hmm. Uh, well, that, that, any of that, and and I want uh, there's so much I want to talk to you about, but we only have so much time, and I want to see some of your art as well. But in part, we've been talking about architecture hmm. and and disability from a child's point of view. In later years, and uh, today, you're continually thinking about that, and. Uh, you had some ideas about that that you wanted to talk before we look at your some of your art. Uh, why don't we go from there? Well, the thing about inaccessible architecture is that it sends you a series of messages. Um, one is that obviously you're not welcome, but also as you imagine ways that things could be ameliorated, um, uh, you're aware that these things are expensive. 
and you're either explicitly or implicitly told that um, to make the kind of changes um, that would be required to really make things accessible uh, are too expensive for the likes of you. So at least people of my own age that grew up in such an inaccessible world, we carry, I think, often a kind of mixed anger and guilt about wanting things to be changed and knowing as adults what it is we're asking for. So, you know, one of the examples I use, uh, Ren and I were talking about grocery stores and how in theory they're accessible. You go in and there's, you know, electric doors and the aisles are wide and you can use the bathroom, blah, blah, blah. But what I can't do, so this guy is probably, you know, let's say 5'10", something like that. I'm 4'9". So I'm about here on him. It used to be that I could reach anything in a grocery store. I now cannot reach the top uh, shelf at all, not because I've shrunk, but yes, I have. These things happen, all right, they happen. But mainly because uh, grocery stores are becoming higher and higher. And I think also Americans in general are getting taller and taller, but it's also, I think, um, somehow this idea that somehow we're going to get this stuff so i told ren that i spend my time in grocery stores wandering around looking for guys like this you know can somebody get this down can somebody get this down and it takes me three times as long to do grocery shopping so we were talking about well what would you do and i'm like well what if you realize a grocery store should be a third longer just just longer buildings and you could have longer lower shelves or you could arrange them in a more chopped up way. Or I think, I'm sure that there are ways that you could plan an interior that wouldn't uh, insist on people like me having to constantly get help. And people say, well, use the grabber things. Let me tell you, if you're trying to get something like this, like something liquid off the top with a grabber, you better have some health insurance. That thing's gonna come down on your head and it is not going to be fun. So when we were talking about the hospital, uh, I was saying, well, what about things like um, more play spaces, smaller play spaces, play spaces that if a kid is uh, in a situation where there's um, concern about uh, contagion, that maybe there could be a room with a, bar a glass wall in between but like board games on both sides or Zoom on both sides, something where the kids could play together and see each other um, and you know, not have to wait until they're allowed to leave their room. Um, shelves where you could have your belongings, bulletin boards where you could put stuff up, things, trying to think through things that would let kids and for that matter, older people I've spent a hell of a lot of time in the hospital as an adult. It would have been great to be able to have somewhere to bring my art supplies and put them up somewhere that would be accessible. Um, but the idea is that you're supposed to pass through quickly. And I understand that, but I still feel that it comes down to what is the, what's the value here. So the reason I'm showing this very quickly is this is some place I worked for about six years. I ran, helped run the arts and culture program. This is Access Living, which is a center for independent living in Chicago. These are not residential places. These are uh, um, political and cultural um, activism sites. So everything from teaching you how to get a PA, uh, changing the rules in the public schools, um, Access Living is fa famous for a lot of things, including having gotten all of the buses in Chicago, converted to kneeling buses, um, getting there to be an enormous fleet of accessible taxis. Um, uh, but the building itself is 100% accessible. And a lot of it comes down to not fancy stuff, but design decisions, just pure design decisions. So for instance, just to show you here on the floor, <clears throat> this is um, carpeting that is uh, wheelchair friendly. It's just thick enough to be comfortable for people 
you need a little bit of cushioning, but it has a lot of really nice bite so that your wheels get traction. And it's not an expensive carpet. It's just the right carpet. Um, there's a lot I could say about this place, but I won't. And now we get to the very beginning of my work. Just, just before we get there, let's talk for one or two minutes about the, the dilemma that you play, placed. Um, yeah. That, that uh, what it, you have a word for, for people like us who are not, not differently abled. What are we? We're. Don't ever say differently abled. I, I, whatever I've done. I, I, do I did that. Precisely, so you could do that. But what, 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 you like to see the steam come up, you know. Yeah, right. But what? But what do you call us? Well, I mean, within disability uh, discourse, normates. Normates, okay. Normates. So, um, the, so we were talking, for example, about the paradox. Uh, Christopher Hitchens used to we used to talk about how there was all this controversy about making ramps on sidewalks so that people on wheelchairs could do it, and then suddenly. Once that happened, it was actually actually wonderful for people with strollers, with baby strollers, but it was very bad for for blind people. And then they actually have solved that by putting those little bumps as you approach it. So, I mean, it, it's a. I guess I guess what's fascinating is is we were also, by the way, talking about how when it, those of you who know the Getty Garden in in Los Angeles that Robert Irwin built. <laughs> Uh, he wanted originally to have the, that, that sound as trains going by. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Uh, it's not elephants. Uh, but, but, I'm disappointed. Uh, yeah, anyway, the, 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 there's a stream that goes down the middle of the garden. And originally, he wanted to have a path that went down the middle of the garden. And, uh, and he was told, you know, can't because it's too steep for wheelchairs. And he said, well, the wheelchair people can go over there and over there. He said, no, everybody has to be able to do it. The result was that he had to come up with a whole different way. And those who have gone there know about that zigzag path that goes down with all those bridges. And in each bridge, it became the thing of the garden. I mean, those bridges are different at each bridge. It's different kinds of uh, sounds of water, different kinds of uh, uh, plants around each bridge crossing and so forth. It's possible to imagine vivid ways of approaching these things that are to everybody's benefit. But it doesn't require imagination, and and I guess that's partly what you're calling for. Well, also there is such a thing as conflicting accommodation, and that's something that we're dealing with a lot in disability as people start to understand what kind of accommodations are useful in the world. There are, I mean, just a fast example: um, audio description for films. Mm -hmm. I've been to a number of films now that are. It used to be that you had an audio description with headsets. So the people who required it would have headsets on and there'd be somebody in the back of the room describing the film. Now the ethos is that it should be something that everyone experiences so that you don't have to identify whether or not you need it. And it personally for me, uh, makes it so I can't watch the film. So I've, I feel terrible about it, but I understand that that accommodation is not for me. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to kind of understand how to be present to it. And it's just one of those things that's not going to work for me. But part of accessibility is duking that stuff out and trying to figure out what should happen when and where. And that everything can't be the same for everybody. So anyway, oh, whoops, didn't mean to do that. So let's, uh, I, did want, I did want to have, uh... Let's let's maybe talk for ten or fifteen minutes about the your own work and the role it's played in, yes. in your evolution, and uh, and then we'll open up. And by the way, people should be beginning to think about questions that might be useful uh, and helpful and to worry things out here. But, I keep seeing so, my friend Sharona flickering back and forth. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so t t tell us about your evolution as an artist. Well, I was originally okay. Um, the first thing to say is that when I went to art school, I was completely and totally um, heavily discouraged from making work about the things, uh, my bodily experience, primarily disability, but queerness as well. And um, although it turned out that queerness was much more accessible, uh, acceptable than disability, um, it's still in many ways true. Uh, so my early work was uh, about desire between women um, and 
these are, you know, awkward little paintings, but it was me starting to try and figure out how to uh, uh, explore something about my physical existence. So these are very small, this is only six inches. And I noticed that there's a wall there behind, basically. There's yeah, a, a lot of architecture in my, uh, you know, the intimacy of space, privacy of space, um, small rooms, they show up all the time. But you will notice there is not what one would call perspective in this image. Yeah, not a lot of depth of field here. Um, this was another one, uh, me with, with my girlfriend at the time. Again, about seven inches square. Um, and then I started doing work about the hospital and my gallerist threw me out. Um, she didn't want to see, she was doing really well with some other work I was doing. It was selling without effort. And when I started doing work, even about this, she said, I can't sell these, sent them home and I walked out. So, um, but this is called diagnosis one because there's some work dealing with the inter overlap between diagnoses and enunciations. Um, the, the doctor is mystically appearing here. Oh, why is this doing this? Another one about trying to decipher what was being told to me. Uh, it's about I don't know, seven by 10 inches, um, the dread of waiting, and also the way that I perceive my body and still perceive it as having been signed by all my surgeons. So here are a few, this is Dr. McClone here in Chicago, if anybody knows, but a cluster of my surgeons going down my back. And then there was a moment, so I was very uncomfortable about who I was. Uh, even while I was doing this work, I was really in a lot of denial about being disabled, wouldn't talk to people about it, um, was kind of pussyfooting around it in the work. And I ended up going to Anderson Ranch and studying with an incredible painter named uh, Bailey Dugan. Um, look her up, please. It's Dugan with two O's. And uh, it was this crazy thing called um, the psychological self-portrait up in the, the mountains of Colorado. And what it turned out to be, which I did not know until I got there, was that we were all going to take off our clothes and paint ourselves in the nude in this big converted garage. And I about had a breakdown. And Peggy helped me construct this little cabana out of towels and stuff so that I could do it without anybody seeing me. So this was the very first painting I did, um, looking honestly at myself. And I couldn't have gone forward to do anything that I've done since if I hadn't done that. And this is 18 by 24. So these are all acrylic. Did, did you have a feeling of triumph once you did it? Was there I'm a feeling of nausea? <laughs> so it, it was only nausea, yeah. but, but not a feeling of elation? Yeah. I, I did feel like I, this was my breakthrough. It was still really hard for me to look at. I kept it in a box, um, but it did open up the door. To everything that came after. Um, it's owned by some um, really important academics in uh, Philadelphia. And every once in a while when I visit them, I clean it and come face to face. It's, it's too bad. It, this is such a dark slide. You're using, losing a huge amount of it. reminds me, by the way, of a story I've told you about Brayton Breitenbach, who was yeah. South African Africana artist who had to spend uh, eight years because of, as a political prisoner in a white cell, you know, uh, uh, box. And when he came out, uh, he wasn't sure he could paint still. He was a painter as well as a poet. And the first painting he did was a self-portrait in a shaped canvas that was the shape of a bathroom mirror. And it was his own face with his eyes closed. And I asked him, why, why are your eyes closed? And he says, because I wasn't sure I could look at myself yet. And that likewise was a huge breakthrough for him uh, beyond that. But anyway, continue. Oh, well, I mean, you know, I'm sure a lot of people know what Terra Incognita is, but if you saw a detail of this, you'd see that there's a compass rose here hmm. on my body. This is going forward. I started to really do self portraits. Um, these, the images you're gonna see are really scattered through time. Um, so we're bouncing around. 
This is uh, 36 by something um, acrylic on paper. And um, cauda equina is the word for the cluster of nerves at the bottom of the spinal cord. It comes off like a horse's tail, which is what cauda equina means, horse's tail. So this is um, another self-portrait trying to- By the way, I should mention that around this time, you are, one of the ways you're making a living is that you are teaching anatomy at the School of the Art Institute. Yeah, that was incredible. I started to, um, I'd, I'd been studying for years there with a brilliant woman named Elizabeth Ockwell. And when she retired, I got her job. And, um, and then subsequently ended up a year after that last piece, uh, becoming the visiting artist in the cadaver lab at U of, U of I at Chicago. University of um, Illinois. University of Illinois. And I'm now once again being invited back into the cadaver lab at Northwestern. Um, I teach in the cadaver lab, but I don't teach with the cadavers. I teach something else that we can talk about uh, in a bit. But, um, but I am passionate about anatomy and, and the experience of ghost lab. And um, one of my ongoing rants is that uh, too many schools are converting away from the active uh, anatomy lab and either towards something called prosection, where students just watch a dissector go through a series of dissections but never touch a scalpel, or horrors of horrors, they work with uh, a huge digital cadaver table that's literally a big sheet of, you know, digital glass where you look at the layers of the cadaver through the magic of technology and I think it's not going to produce the doctors that we particularly want, but that's just me. Um, anyway, this is another self-portrait later. Uh, these are all, this is all dimensional. A lot of my work became very dimensional. And so these are real veterinary surgical needles. And um, these dolls, which are made of organza, uh, have pieces of my body that were either removed or uh, altered through surgery. But more to the point, um, much more of my work is portraiture of others. And going back to the hospital, what I say about this is that because um, the only real thing, moving, interesting, compelling thing in the hospital as a kid is people, you know, people's faces. Um, people's voices, language, uh, body language, um, the relationship between words and what's about to happen to you. So I've become just hyper, hyper sensitized to the human face and body. And in 1997, so like I said, I was really in denial about my actual status as a disabled person. And then I met this woman and she it was a, very successful young actress um, in her mid twenties. Um, she's the daughter of a famous actor named Mike Nussbaum. Um, and she was on her way to acting school when uh, a bus, I think, lost control and jumped the sidewalk and hit her. And she became quadriplegic. And after that, it's a very long story. She became one of the most powerful uh, activists in the history of Chicago not just in politics, but in culture. And when we met, um, she insisted that I come to this thing called the Disabled Artists Coalition. And I was like, blah, why would I do that? Don't ban, no, oh, maliki, maliki. And she basically grabbed me and said, you don't have a choice. So that is how I met the founders of disability culture in America, um, or a group of them here in Chicago. And they completely changed my life. So what I started to do was I wanted to make traditional portraits. I started to see them as incredibly beautiful. And I'd always been a fan of Northern Renaissance portraiture, knew that I didn't have that kind of chops, but that was the inspiration for starting to do portraits of disabled people that were not medical portraits, that weren't freak show, that weren't telethons or poster children or trying to use the tropes of traditional portraiture and very deep interviews um, to start depicting who they were. I was, so gonna, say that, I was gonna say that you, you said it was face and body, but it's face, body, and story. Yes, right, exactly. These are all based on um, two things, 
long interviews in which I learn about not only their lives, but the work they do, how their bodies influence their work, but also ethics. Um, because the one thing I know is that it's incredibly hard as a disabled person to let yourself be looked at. Um, the amount of cruelty that comes at us on a regular basis, if you read my book, you'll get, a, you'll get an insight into what we go through. And it's still happening to me. I'm 63. It's never stopped. Um, that if I'm going to ask someone to let me look at them, uh, it's asking a lot. So I do this thing where I give people as much power as I can um, in the process. So I know we don't have much time. We're going to go somewhat quickly through these Michelin. So these are the Chicagoans whose portraits I did uh, to start my career in this direction. This is pretty much a life-size painting of Techie, um, an actress and playwright. Um, Mike Urban and Anna Stoneham. Mike is an essayist uh, who has muscular dystrophy and was a poster child uh, and on Jerry Lewis's telethon and writes just blisteringly about what that was like. Um, but also one of the reasons I put this in here is that I was raised to believe I would never have a relationship, that I would never have a family, have children. I'd always be alone. And that the only thing I could hope for was to meet a nice disabled boy and nice, nice crippled boy, I believe it was something like that. And we could take care of each other, which just sounded like so much fun. So I ran away from that too. And then I met Mike and Anna and I just watched them. And I realized they were just married. They were just a married couple. It wasn't like consolation prizes or two caretakers or anything. They were just people who loved each other. And it completely changed how I felt. And so when I met this hunka hunka um, a little bit later, uh, we were together for almost a decade. He was the first disabled person I was ever with. And that was just an incredibly profound relationship. And yes, my centerfold. Uh, this is another one from a slightly later series. Um, I know we don't have much time. It's a very large charcoal drawing, uh, I think 44 by 30. Um, a singer and performance artist named Nomi Lam. So a lot of these images are based on particular things where in this case, I was asking people, and you'll see Ren's portrait in this series in a moment. I was asking people about when they went through very destabilizing times, particularly trauma, but even joy that can knock you off balance balance anytime that you kind of lost track of who you were and what were the images and symbols that brought them back um what were sort of the core things and so in nomi's case for a number of reasons it was a seal oh god stop talking touching the mouse it's a very nervous mouse um this is matt frazier whom you guys might have seen on either american horror story uh 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 Good Omens, um, his Dark Materials on Broadway and his version of Beauty and the Beast. Um, Matt chose a, a freak show performer who had his same impairment. Matt is part of that uh, generation of uh, kids whose mothers were given thalidomide in Europe. Yeah. And that produced a condition called Focomelia. Each one of these, there's such stories. This is Lynn Manning who was shot and blinded in his 20s, ended up becoming the founder of Watts Village Theater in Los Angeles. Um, Alison Bechdel, who a lot of you will know of. Um, this, I assume, people, uh, writer of Fun Home. We were working on this when she was writing the sequel called Are You My Mother? And very long story, but Alison did the drawing of her mother on a separate sheet of paper and I transferred it. Are You My Mother uh, is deeply invested in psychoanalysis. And I'll just point out that in the drawing, her mother is ignoring her, which is what the book is largely about. And the only place where they're actually together, which is in the reflection in the mirror, uh, Helen Bechdel's uh, smoke is crossing out their relationship. And Allison told me it was completely unconscious and that's why she got the MacArthur and not me. 
So, um, and you might recognize this comely gentleman. Uh, Ren, you want to say a little bit about this? Well, just quickly, because I want you to show other pictures, but this is a, uh, I like this picture a lot. Uh, it is a rather intensive thing being interviewed by you. And, and we talked about different things that were important to me. <clears throat> Athanasius Kircher, the, the great uh, 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 wonder cabinet person of the 17th century, who invented the slide projector. And that is a slide of his view of what the inside of the earth looked like. Uh, we were also talking about Kabbalah that suddenly shows up on my tie. And then the, the uh, cat's cradle is that you asked me at one point if I could give you some manuscript pages. In this case, it was manuscript pages of my writing about Poland on a legal pad and suddenly it showed up that way. Anyway, it was quite, uh, and it, it's a big thing. It, 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 I, I liked it a lot actually, but, but I anyway, love this piece. But, it, but move on, move on. Regina <laughs> Laspina, um, uh, activist for housing in New York who transformed uh, the status of accessible housing in the city of. And those uh, are three Seattle. separate drawings in that. Yes, those are, jeez. Oh, Let's go back, yeah. Okay. Three rather yeah. large. And I'll just point out, this is her best friend growing up um, in the hospital. And Wendy killed herself. Um, she had spina bifida as well. And she, both of them were told as young girls, that it was really a shame that they were so beautiful because their beauty was a waste because no one would ever want them. So Nadina's activism has actually centered around saving young disabled women. And so that, the, that, that, that shadowy figure was a friend of hers and who killed herself. Best friend who killed herself at the age of 20, 21, I believe. And in the IV bags are uh, little doll dresses in homage to all the girls that we've lost. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, very intense stories. And Dana has her own uh, memoir out, and it's, it's charming. Um, this is a really important piece to me. This is Tim Lowley, who is my painting brother. Um, he's the only other artist I'm close to who really works on uh, visual depictions of disability. In his case, his daughter, Tema, who at the age of four days, I think, had uh, a stroke and became cortically blind um, and has no bodily control. And as I mentioned, ethics is really important to my procedures, um, particularly informed consent. And because Tema can't give me consent, I refused to do her portrait when Tim asked me to. So instead I did a portrait of their relationship and it's hard to see here, but this is fully dimensional. Tim himself is a drawing, but Tema is constructed of, um, clay and bark paper and Bible pages. These are taken from pieces of the Bible and organdy and the wing of the owl comes four inches off the surface of the drawing, um, just to give you an idea. Why an owl? Because I was thinking, well, he chose the owl as his avatar, but then, then I thought later how perfect it was because Tim's wisdom as a person has really been so centered on understanding what it is to be Tema, to sort of dissolve himself into Tema's experience of the world, which is essentially a mystery. He'll never know. She doesn't communicate in who, any emotional way. Who, who? Yes, exactly, who. So I would urge people to look up Tem's work. It is just surpassingly wonderful. And this is Alice Shepard, who is changing dance as we know it. This is another piece. This is a series from a series where I walk out of my um, apartment during a series of three hour sittings. It's two hour mark. I walk out. I give my uh, collaborator total control of my apartment, everything. They can do anything they want, but in exchange, they have to alter the portrait while I'm gone. So Alice added some things that were rather un unnerving. This is a very large piece on several sheets of mylar. So this is translucent and stacked up. And Alice uh, added among things, little creatures heading for her crotch. Um, but Alice, uh, again, these people that I'm showing you are brilliant. Alice, for instance, is doing work now. This is her wheelchair turned on the side. When, so when she, I asked her how she wanted to pose, she, um, Someone doesn't have their 
mic muted. I keep hearing something from turn, something. On, turn on your mute. Yeah. If you're, yeah, there you yes, go. Please, please mute your mics. Um, anyway, uh, she got up on her wheelchair sideways naked and I could see the hardware pressing into her skin and I'm like, ah, band-aids, band-aids band -aids, and you know, it's what she wanted. But now she's doing work where uh, she's doing aerial work with wheelchairs where her wheelchair and her collaborators wheelchairs are up in the air on on hoists doing aerial work. I you cannot believe it until you see it. Um, this is uh, I rarely get a chance to do a portrait of anyone who's like me. Carrie, her impairment is similar to mine. It's not the same. Uh, it's sort of related, uh, but she is one of my closest friends. And one of the things that I love about this piece, it's, it's almost life size, is that you may have noticed that in most of the portraits, I try not to focus on pain because people think that that's what disability is about, that it's about pain. And they will read an image as a pain image, no matter what I do. But in Carrie's case, she is part of the BDSM community and has eroticized pain. And so when I asked her what she wanted to do, that's where she wanted to go. So I wanted to do this kind of Flemish lighting feeling, uh, you know, a woman who is just completely as frankly herself as anyone I've ever worked with. And then I, one of the last images, um, I keep coming back to self-portraits. This is a sizable acrylic. Um, I won't say too much about it. It really was about the stages continually of coming back to being, acknowledging who I am, even if not coming to terms with it. And then uh, during COVID, um, I could, I have not been able to have anyone in my studio that shut my practice down almost completely. But I started to work with um, doing portraits over Zoom. And this was the first one I did. This is renowned activist, Alice Wong, who uh, gets oxygen support, lives in San Francisco, doesn't really leave her house very much, if at all, but was, for instance, on the cover of British Vogue, incredibly powerful. Um, so this was on Mylar again. And then Sharona, here you are. Um, this was a very recent piece where Sharona and I decided to really go for it. And we were um, exploring the phenomena first here of um, letting people see your life. So she posed in her bedroom uh, with laundry and pajamas and messy hair kind of leaning in in that sort of distorted way that people look when they're looking into the and then in liminal space here um you can see in this she's wearing her mask but not here and then because i keep working with ethics and power i asked her to take a series of screenshots of me um david is here on screen uh, and I would be forced to draw myself. There's a lot to say about all these. And to end up with architecture, this is my college boyfriend who is an architect. And in this portrait, he built the objects. Uh, we were mailing things back and forth. Again, he sat for me right before COVID and then not after, but we were mailing things. And this little house is about the arc of our relationship. So, I'm stopping. Just, I'm going to stop share, and here we are. Well, you took away the book too quickly, but there it is. Oh, and, and by the way, the book has a lot of these portraits in it, and so yes. forth. It's a beautifully produced book. They did and an incredible job. I urge, I urge you. So we went long, but we still have a little time for questions, right. I should think. And and uh, you'll give us a better sense. Have people been asking things, or what are your thoughts, David? In fact, I. I... I was trying to sneak in just to say, please don't rush. I, oh. I actually didn't want you to 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 to, to go too quick through the your images because strained my tongue, David. <laughs> because okay, no, but I mean it's just extraordinarily beautiful and powerful and moving, and um and I was trying to send Ren messages saying, please 
you slow down like we can go as long as it takes but mm -hmm. but you know here we are and 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 hopefully um you know the, the conversation can can bring bring up what whatever um uh, whatever uh comes up <laughs> yeah you know i i i just there's a, there's a few things i have to share that just incredibly moving um you know you know one of one of our hopes with this um, exhibition with you know what we're doing uh is to uh is to really broaden our the spectrum of of the spatial imagination that architects uh think of architecture to be meaning you know meaning architectures it's and and this is exactly the nerve of space ethics literature story life that you're touching on which is that it it ultimately the conversation between us and our spatial environment is so immediate and so um direct you know i often say as 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 we build the room the room builds us you know yes. <laughs> what did i write ren in my that's what i wrote in right. the my notes notes. Notes. yes go on I heard it in everything you were saying. I mean, the 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 the, the, the incredible, um, uh, uh, both tactile and literary relationship to the your youth, the, the 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 spaces of your youth, and the way in which they, you know, uh, re reciprocally created your identity. Um, and to me, the the there's an objective which is architecture perceives itself as so superficial, it's unbelievable. It is actually literally in a conversation with people's identities and, it, and, and it's creating um, the potentiality of life, partially because of the obstructions of justice that you're describing in the supermarkets, et cetera, but, but also because of the, 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 the more uh, whispering, the more silent kind of exchanges that go on between all of us at any age, you know, young and old, we're, we're always listening to our spatial atmospheres. And, and so I, I absolutely love, to me, the mission of our uh, uh, intervention in the Biennale is for architects to wake up and realize that they have to become uh, literary figure. You know, they have to think of it as literature, what they're doing. They, they, can't, they can't think of it as, as you know, this, this superficial, it, it, life is, lives are at stake. And I mean- By the way, um, I was minding my own business as all of my stories begin when you gave me a call and just asked me for names of people, you, you kind of gave that spiel and, I, and you said, well, who do you think would be good to talk to? And I said, well, Reva. And you said, who? And I said, go get this That's book. That's what people say. <laughs> That's what a lot of people say. But I said, go get this book. Yeah, oh, this book seriously. One of, it occurs to me, by the way, one thing about Riva, we mentioned that it's face, body, story, but the thing that's really interesting is voice. And the thing that is so powerful about the book, you get a sense of it hearing her just now, but the, the voice in the book is just, you know, as a fellow writer, I, I, it just, I'm, I really envy her, her gift. Well, David, what I was gonna say to your point, is that I was making notes when Ren and I were in the run up to this. And what I ended up writing in my notes is that every piece of architecture is um, a set of instructions uh, for behavior. And that, you know, in the way that the hospital is giving us very clear signals as to how a patient, a child, or an adult should behave in terms of constraint, freedom, submission autonomy, you know, <clears throat> who's allowed to do what where. Once I came home, I thought a lot about how my family home was a whole different set of instructions. And that I've always been very aware as I go through the world, going into spaces, what am I allowed to do here? What am I expected to do here? What are other people doing here? Um, and I think that too often people don't think about architecture as this series of uh, very loud um, constraints, you know, telling you how to be appropriate. 
Yeah, ap- you, you absolutely perfectly said it's so loud, and and uh, and so often um, the authors of this loud megaphone have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> you know, they don't recognize what is being projected in enormous volume, and it's it's something that I, I think about all the time. I, I just I, I I can't help it. I have to share something with you. You know, I was super luck, lucky duck because you know I I went to, to Cooper Union School of Architecture. My oh. mentor was John Hayduck. He was the founding dean of Cooper, and I I was insanely lucky. I be, I became his associate dean when I was a very young uh, man, and um, and 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 John embraced a giant spectrum of 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 um, of disciplines because of this, meaning we had, you know, philosophers and literary figures and anthropologists and, you know, everybody coming in because the humanities, essentially the story, the voice, the story as the of the discipline. Uh, But one of the figures we had was a surgeon named Dr. Richard Selzer, who was, became a great writer. um, And uh, he wrote, uh, you know, he, he had his, he spent his entire life in hospitals. Uh, at, at the age of 45, he decided he wanted to learn how to write. Um, and, and I knew him very well. He's passed on since. He, 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 he probably lived till about 90. Um, and Selzer used to come. John used to bring him to Cooper. I mean, we had a, Dr. Richard Selzer, the surgeon, teaching in the studios, specifically wow. to open up these questions of, of the literary dimension of our lives relative to spaces hospitals. He wrote an incredible book called The Exact Location of the Soul, which each chapter is an organ of the body. And there's stories of surgery. It's basically stories of surgery relative to life, empathy, ethics, the body. He also wrote a book called Down from Troy, which is his memoir. He's from Troy, New York, which is eight miles from where I'm sitting right now. Um, but I just, there's a quote that I have always loved from him and it's about a hospital and I, I have to share it with you because cells are, you know, I- incredible. So uh, sorry for taking up so much time. But no, I, this is great. So Dr. Selzer, he says, quote, where is the architect who without sacrificing function and practicality will think of the hospital as a pregnant woman who suffers the occupancy of a human being who enters, dwells for a time, and ultimately passes forth. Where is the architect who from the very moment he begins his design will be aware that in each room of his hospital, of, uh, someone will die. Who while seated at his drawing board will pause to feel upon his naked forearms the chill wind of his mortality. One day, he too will enter this building, not as its architect, but as a supplicant in duress need. If I am wrong, and such human emotions cannot be expressed in architecture, why then it is time to surrender the hospital to writers who will build it of words and dreams. (laughs) Doctor, You're reminding me one of my favorite books. I don't know if you've ever read this is The Children's Hospital by Chris Adrian. Yes, I know that. Uh, what an, for the audience, it's about a children's hospital that becomes unmoored as the planet Earth is de- deluged by a, a flood. And the only thing left on the surface of the waters is a floating children's hospital. It's, it's an incredible book. Hmm. Yeah. So I do we just- have questions. Do we have questions from other people? Out there in the world? Let me see, and, and, um, and for that matter, people should unplug themselves and start talking to us. Well, what I was just going to say is, is speaking of access, maybe, maybe, maybe we just unmute everyone and yeah. have this conversation. Or they, well, or if you have something to say, you. unmute yourself and, and yeah. join us. I don't, I, I'm not, uh, I don't know how to do it, but please, uh, please join us by unmuting and, and sharing. Can we do gallery view where I can see everybody? Let me see. Um, go up in the corner where it says view. I, I know. I'm, I'm only seeing that and then go to and, and tap it and then go to gallery. Well, hi, Tom. Many people are hiding, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> well, we can hear them if they unmute themselves. <laughs> <laughs> seeing a friend in bed. I'm seeing. <laughs> oh my God! Hey, open. I've your- got. I, I've got a question. 
Okay. Yeah. Can you hear Identify me? yourself first and then ask. Hi there. My name is uh, Sue Ellen Strom, and uh, this has been remarkable. I just I don't want to forget to say I, I, I'm, I'm an artist. And I'm sitting here in my uh, porch studio. Um, I recently have been described as a disabled person, but it's not so excruciating as your disability that you grew up with. And um, at the same time, I re hmm? it's not a contest. <laughs> no, no, not that it's not a contest, but uh, the things that you've overcome and achieved are kind of remarkable. And I'm sitting here going, Jesus, I'm a little whiny baby. <laughs> sure. So I, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm so impressed. But I just, um, I've been dealing with this, these issues and I, I recognize, you know, the, the inhumanity, the not listening, the thing like people can't look at you and know exactly what you're dealing with because things are, you're not showing it. But um, how did you go into the disability and have that bravery? Because I feel like I have to hide. No, no, first, when I, when I was ill, I, I told everyone about it. And then I felt like I lost all of my friends and family <laughs> just by, you know, the emotional stuff I was going through, changed my personality, that kind of thing. And so I kind of tend to want to hide it in my art and I'm, I'm just losing it like I'm painting flowers all the time everybody wants to be happy colorful and I'm, uh, I also did a self-portrait and um, it's my stuff is more psychological because you can't see it on the outside how did you find it within yourself to face this and take it on like I am this and I'm I'm I just want to know how like emotionally mentally how did how do you Mainly be yourself in the world you know community. I I found you know I, I touched on it briefly but I found those initial um, people. I mean, the the group that I found were people who were sarcastic and funny and rebellious and analytical. And what I realized I needed at the time, I didn't need a support group, which is what I was afraid I was getting. Um, I had no interest in that. What I needed was analysis and perspective and that's what i found and i would hazard to say that whatever impairment you're dealing with there are quite a number of artists writers performers filmmakers um doing work about it and uh there was just a festival i was part of i mean there are there are festivals now all, all over the country and and since they're virtual um there are a lot easier for people to get to, but I would um, just start Googling whatever, whatever sort of general arena your impairment um, exists within and see who's doing what kind of work. And some of it will be crap and self, you know, not, not particularly incisive, but I can guarantee you that there's incredible work out there. So I think that once you find a way that people have found a language um, and an aesthetic, there's a lot about disability aesthetic that um, whether it's uh, psychological or, or somatic, there, there's a lot of um, exploration of what the aesthetics are um, in our various experiences. So I think that, that that's absolutely where I would start. Thank Other you. questions? Comments? People? No people, I've stunned everyone into submission. Uh, I'll, well, while people are gathering up the nerve, and I do wish you would, some of you would come in, uh, you and I have an ongoing conversation. <laughs> we have several. We have several. One of them is uh, kind of related to the picture you did of Allison and of me about uh, trying to draw you out from primarily focusing on disability, although that's incredibly important and important to you and important to the community and important to everybody and very valuable. But I want you to do to, to just be taking in all of humanity in, in complicated. I do. I mean, I've, I've been, uh, you know, I mean, my friend whose portrait I showed is not Right. No, I know there are a few, but I just I, I encourage that in you because you are you are I, I worry sometimes and then maybe respond to this that you get yourself into a niche situation where you are 
uh, oh, you are the disability artist, but you are not just that. You are, you are an extraordinary artist and an extraordinary writer, both. And, and I love it when you stretch. Well, my feeling is also that it's important for me to work with people. I mean, I work with a lot of people who are genderqueer. Um, I didn't have a chance to show those portraits. I mean, this is a fraction just a little fraction of the work that I've done. Mm -hmm. And I also work a lot with people who are trans and queer, for instance. Um, and anybody really who just has a sense of themselves as an outsider, because I'm really interested too in, I'm really mostly interested in stigma. I mean, the disability work gets a lot of attention, but really I'm most interested in what it means to be somebody who is just doesn't slot in very easily with their place and time. And because first off, for me, those are absolutely the most interesting people, but also because I know that my own survival is not just about um, having a community of disabled people, although I talk about that a lot. Um, mainly I talk about that a lot because it's, you know, there's not a lot of it. I mean, a lot of other people have worked on queerness. A lot of other people have worked on psychological portraiture. Um, very few people that I know of have worked on at least painting and drawing of people with impairments. Um, so that tends to get a lot of the attention. And a lot of the people who come to me and say, I want to sit for you. And I go, I, um, I, that doesn't work with me almost ever. Um, Hi, Reba. Um, yeah. My name is Terry Abruzzo. Thank you so much. This has been just fascinating. And you too, Ren. Um, I'm in Chicago as well. And my son visited Access Living in first grade and, and it changed him for the good. And I, so I know what you're talking about there, but I had posted a question in the chat that talked about aging as one of these other rings that you're talking about. And although I don't think that it's considered a form of disability. They do seem to have a lot of the same hallmarks. And I wonder if, as you think about aging yourself, whether you feel like some of the work that you did in order to recreate your identity, I mean, I know you were very young when you left the hospital, but being in and out and being stripped of that, you know, during your various visits to the hospital, whether that might help you deal with the aging process and, um, and some of the inevitable losses that'll come with that. And then I had another question that I hope you don't mind if it's too personal, please don't. But I, I, if I did the math right, it looked like you lost your mother at age 17, is that right? Which seems quite young for someone who was dealing with all that you were dealing with and having such a strong and loving advocate. And I just, um, and even delay, I'm sorry for your loss and I'm, I'm just wondering how that impacted you at the time that's such a young age to have lost someone that a person with all the things you were dealing with would need so much i would imagine i'm going to apologize and say that i'm not going to discuss that because that is a very complicated piece of the book and it's the only there are only two things that i don't talk about in live events um, and one is what happened to my mother, and the other is something that happened to me, because I worked very hard for them to come as something of a surprise in the, uh, in the narrative, and I would really urge you, um, this is not me showing. Oh, I look, no, I look forward to that. I tried to buy it, but I, th I think it's only in hardback right now, and I'm not, like, I'm not organized enough to have gotten that. <laughs> well, it's, it's coming out in paper in, uh, at the end of October. So it will be coming. Um, All right. No, so hardback's it. great. I just need to do it. I didn't have it in time to read for this, but it, it's fine. I, just, it. I just have to tell people the freaking gorgeous job they did. I mean, ah. just for people who don't know much about publishing. So here's the deal. Um, so here's one of the pages, uh, that one, that image that Ren was talking about. Um, normally in a book with a lot of imagery, they do what's called a signature where they take photo paper and they make a little chunk of, of picture section um, and they put it often in the middle or the back of the book and images don't go through the book itself. Um, it's very 
expensive to do what's called color on page, but One World committed to doing it. And I was insistent because the images, as you read the book, um, I chose each image very carefully to go with each chapter. Mm -hmm. Some of the relationships are subtle. Some of them are pretty overt, but there's a reason that each image is paired with the chapter and the images are their own story moving through the book. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they not only did color on page beautifully, they also designed it gorgeously and ha, there's a secret cover. Mm. The cover is another cover. So they threw some they threw some bucks at this thing. So uh, I would urge people to get the hardback because the paperback isn't necessarily going to do mm -hmm. everything that this does. Um, but getting back to your first question about aging. Um, oh my, an actress I quite admire just showed up. Um, well, I love your work. Um, anyway, uh, it's twofold. As I'm getting older, I can tell that people are writing off my disability as being aging. Mm. And so I'm becoming kind of a pathetic little old lady, I think. Um, but also <laughs> there's a real difference between, there's, a, there's an ick factor for society if they think your disability is um, natal is congenital. Um, there's something wrong with you all the way through. If there's something wrong with you because of aging, it's sad, but it's not ick in the same way. So, uh, but also more to the point is we gather new disabilities as we age. We think we know what the set is on the cupboard, you know, in the China cabinet, but all of a sudden there are all these new interesting disabilities filling up the shelves and it is not as much fun as it sounds. So <laughs> they also don't know how people like me age because as Ren pointed out, there are not a lot of me of this particular age thick on the ground. Thank you. Kristen, I, I see you have a question here and I, I, I'd like to ask if you could ask it uh, live. Yeah, forgive me. I'm terrible at questions. In fact, I'm forbidden in most uh, circumstances. But I had a question, Reva. I, I know that you probably are aware of the sort of um, a queer theory becoming, or queer studies, or queer theory becoming so big in the early '90s. And um, I'm trying to remember what I typed in there. Um, uh, but I wonder if you see us. I, I, I remember uh, the late scholar Bill Redding saying, you know, kind of uh, forlornly, well, you know, now everyone seems to be queer in their own way. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and you know, in, in a sort of regretful sense, and, and I experienced this myself being at this sort of belly of the beast of queer theory and studies back then. Um, and, it, it, and so on the one hand, you had a lot of, um, at the worst of it, sort of identity border policing. Um, and then um, I, I guess my question is really, do you see not an analogy because of course this is all intersectional and also I'm not even talking about race, which I normally am doing, but, um, but a, a, a question about dilution versus um, being overly policey about identity. And, and I think this, this was um, maybe uh, connected to the question about aging. And also when, when whoever was talking about uh, supermarkets, or you were talking about supermarkets earlier, I mean, you know, just as women, we have trouble reaching anything in a supermarket. And, you know, that's not typically considered a disability. But anyway, so this is an incoherent question as I'm known to do. Um, but uh, I wonder if, if, you're, if, if you're aware of a trajectory or a concern or a question or an issue about um, dilution of, of disability as an identity. Um. um I think more what's going on is um generational conflict that right. Um, right. those of us who are sort of in and off the use it's just about being old um are being sort of signaled by the younger generations that oh okay you guys did that but you did got all this everything wrong and you don't know anything mm. and go away now. Mm. And so 
um, that's more an issue that I see going on. I mean, certainly, uh, I have, <laughs> I just flew to New York and on the way back from New York, um, my friend was, had this horrible experience at the, at the airport with the TSA. I mean, the single worst experience I've ever had. Mm. But once I got oh, to the gate, I mean, like, like lit litigation level bad. Um, mm -hmm. but once we got to the gate, we saw something like 15 people in wheelchairs. And I thought, God, this is like the society for disability studies when we used to like be flying out to a conference for, for SDS and there'd be like all these people at the gate. So I thought, where are these people coming from? And so we get to the other end and all these people stand up and they're like, well, that worked really well. It like, they, they figured out. That if you ask for wheelchair service, that you get special treatment at the S at the TSA, and you get through faster, and you get to um, choose your own seat on Southwest. So, fifteen people in wheelchairs, maybe three of whom actually needed them. So I sat there, woof, for forty-five minutes waiting for a porter. I mean, it was just because all these porters showed up with wheelchairs. You know, I mean, it's just, but not for me. So it's um, not a fun, I mean, I, I don't know how much people are running up to grab stuff. I think COVID has made things complicated there, but I've certainly seen some pretty bad behavior. Hmm. Oh, the things I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, people out there, you know, COVID, COVID, COVID made all of us think about disability, right? Made everybody scared for their lives, made everybody aware of the threat of other bodies or the acceptability of other bodies. And long COVID is a terror for most of us. I mean, what do people out there, how are you thinking about I mean, here's what drove me up a freaking wall, which is that I thought that when COVID hit, the one good thing might be that it might open up a national conversation about disability. And it didn't. Instead, what happened was that everyone was so terrified of dying that they would talk about anything but. And by to everybody who has to leave. I have to leave soon too. But um, I just wonder what you all are thinking. Or not. I can go for a walk. I'm good with that. <laughs> wow. Well, I think we've stunned them all into submissions. I, th I think we've done. Now look what you've done. Time to go to go bye bye. I think it may be time to go bye bye, but not without first telling you that Reva, this is. I am so proud to know you, and so uh, proud of being part of this conversation. You were wonderful and. Thank you very, very much. You are an incredible friend and you've transformed my life, Mr. Wrestler. Okay. So you can you can you can bully me all you want. Okay. Um, oh, we didn't show people our avatars. You oh, said, yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, I was gonna say, let's have a last punch out. Last okay, right, 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 we right, were right, saying right. that if you needed to like talk over each other. Oh, uh, cool. Have, so the golem meets the uh, punching nun here. So I don't know which side you're on. Is I don't know. I, it's, it's always a question, isn't it? Anyway. Cool. Um, so Having a golem is really, really cool. I don't know what the hell I'm doing with a punching nun, but anyway. <laughs> Reva, Ren, listen, thank you so much. I, absolutely fantastic. Beautiful can, can, conversation, beautiful yeah. work. And uh, and we will find ways to continue to, to, to create special spaces together. Okay. Thank you Thank to you. everyone who came and you can reach me through my website. Please do if you have more thoughts. Thank I you. So much. you. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>